My name is Monk Rowe, and I've already had a fun conversation with Jane Bonnet, and but we'll keep going. Okay. <laughs> you're, in, you're in Toronto, and I'm at Hamilton College in Clinton, New York, and I'm going to introduce you as a soprano saxophonist, a flute player, band leader, and an expert on work visas oh. and passports from other countries. <laughs> wow. That must be okay. tough. Yeah, it, it has been, um, you know, to do all, you know, it's hard enough touring, but to do all the extra work that, you know, uh, that we've had to do um, to get people, you know, into Canada, into the U.S., um, it's been an ongoing thing for probably 40 something years. Um, I mean, our, our first time, Larry and, and mine, my partner, trumpet playing producer husband, um, <clears throat> first went to Cuba, I guess, 81, 82. And that's when we got sort of got very, you know, it was a huge surprise going to Cuba and, and you know, hearing the music that we were hearing. And as we continue to keep visiting it was just we just kept discovering more genres of the music and um you know i've always we've always been interested in the history of jazz and then you get into the history of cuban music and it's so deep and rich and it's just a, a beautiful uh a journey uh, but then we established our very first group spirits of havana with a whole bunch of young not only young people but some older legendary musicians that came through spirits of havana that are no longer with us on earth. Um, and, um, but in some ways, you know, it, 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 all that work, it did establish us um, as doing something a little different than, than other people were, were doing in the jazz, on the jazz scene. I, I, first of all, I consider myself a jazz artist. That's why I, you know, I love the music so much. I love improvising and I love the history of jazz. Um, and then getting into the Cuban music, um, you know, that's when we really, we started as we learned more and more about the genre to bring <clears throat> our ideas into, uh, you know, into the rhythm, many rhythmic um, concepts and the history of, of Cuban music. So that's, that's been that journey. And there's, it's always sort of gone alongside of, some of the other more straight ahead musical endeavors, if it was playing with Paul Blay or Don Pullen, Stanley Cow, Dewey Redman, Billy Hart. Can I ask you about the, the learning process? Um, being a school musician, and that's such a, not a helpful term, but I'll use it anyway. Um, learning the Latin rhythms and making them rhythmically become inside you. Did you try to figure it out from actually like transcribing things? Maybe, maybe some, you know, vocal, some of the vocal things. Um, when I got very interested in the Afro-Cuban folkloric music, so I would, um, you know, transcribe maybe some of the vocal lines because of the the, the melodies that were, were so um, lovely and some of the Afro-Cuban chants. <clears throat> but both musics, I am not an academic and I'll be totally honest with that. Um, in terms of my jazz studies, not an academic. The, the way that I got into the music was um, when the ver various musicians would come to Toronto to play, we had a place called the Colonial Tavern. And it, sometimes, you know, there was like five night run there and there was a Saturday matinee. And as a younger person, you could go to the matinee. And, and my father and my brother took me a few times to the matinees. And I met Mingus. I heard Mingus, Ross on Roland Kirk, Horace Silver, Mose Allison, a long list of, uh, of music until like an older and then I could go into the clubs by myself. And, but when I really got hit, you know, with the jazz bug, um, uh, cause I was doing classical music. Um, I guess it would be like in my very late teens. So I'm like 19, 18, 19, 
when the musicians, when I just started to play jazz and um, I would go, you know, go to hear the guys and I would ask for a lesson. And um, that's how I learned, you know, like I had lessons when James Moody came to town, when Frank West came to town, Clifford Jordan would come over here. It was always in an oral manner. And they'd write things down for me. And um, uh, Barry Harris, I went to a number of his classes. Same way with the Cuban music. I went When Larry and I started going to Cuba, we went directly to the musicians and basically hung out with them, took our instruments, went, you know, into the barrios and, and played with some of the folkloric musicians, would take my tape recorder and tape stuff. So <clears throat> it's all been absorbing. And it's all been spending time in the locale of where the music is being made or with the people that are making it. That's always been that, you know, and this is also happening before there was music. There wasn't a jazz studies program uh, when I started playing jazz. Now there's now they're all over the place. There was, uh, you know, um, North Texas State. I know they had a big band program that played you know jazz charts and stuff like that but that was not like a it wasn't a place where you could go study um you know small ensemble playing or learn the language of jazz it was just it was seemed so foreign but um I always I guess and I'm like <laughs> I always say I'm a people person but I always was <clears throat> attracted to the people that were were making the music and, and that's what um drew me in and made me study what they were doing and and learn in that fashion what was the biggest difference from playing from coming uh from bop or you know standard jazz tunes that we're used to playing going down there and sitting in with those musicians and you've mentioned the word folkloric um how did you have to adjust Hmm. I guess <clears throat> the biggest thing would be uh, putting myself in the zone of what they were doing, uh, adapting, listening. Well, of course, you know, listening is just the huge, huge part of of any musical study, um, spending t uh, a big a big thing I've, for me has always been spending time with with the people as people, um, and not just running in, absorbing the music and taking off. You know, it's been it's been a like a bit of a twenty four seven. You go over there, you're maybe drinking some rum with them, and and. Uh, and then the music activity happens and then you're spending more time with them afterwards and say, ah, see you tomorrow. I'll be back. So there's like, it's a, people throw that word around organic process, but it really has been for me and for Larry um, just like that with a big lump of time and a commitment to um, just letting things unfold. And if you're invited, you know, hopefully you're invited to participate there's sometimes I haven't been invited to participate and I've just been a, um, you know, a, a listening and absorbing what I can. And um, I'd like, I'd like to read something here. Um, Victor Rendon is a percussionist. I believe he lives in Brooklyn and he's the leader of the Bronx Connexion Latin jazz big band. And I asked him a similar question about learning it. And, and he said, uh, and I'll paraphrase here, in Cuba, it's by rote. It's an oral tradition. What they do, the novice would basically sit there or maybe stand against the wall and listen, pick it up by ear. If they were not an annoyance, they would let you stay there. And then maybe you would get to play. Yeah, that's that's right on. I totally I'm, I I totally hear them. Yeah, that's exactly what it is like. Yeah, I mean, and it's not you know it's not far off from from the the early jazz traditions too, right? You know, getting up on the bandstand, and if you suck, you're you're off. 
<laughs> if you even 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 if you get that opportunity. Yeah, the you famous know. Uh, symbol throwing at, at Charlie Parker. Oh, wow, boy, <laughs> was it? Um, was the format? I I remember a few years ago there was a there's a group of a professor here who does early American music, and they had a little quote jam session with fiddle and violin, and they were playing these tunes from Americana type tunes. And I took my soprano sax and I thought I sat down with them, but I couldn't fit in because I thought, well, all right, when's it my, my time to solo here? Uh -huh. It wasn't like that. They were playing melodies over and over and then they might switch to a different melody, but it was just like, I'm, I'm lost. Yeah, I understand that. Yeah, well, it was just, you know, it, 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 uh, I understand that because you were maybe coming at it from, it's, I, I understand it. I just don't know how to quite put it, put it in words because uh, um, sometimes you, you just have, it's not like you don't get to shine and do your thing it's more so you just kind of inter interweave through through what's already happening and that's i mean if you hear <clears throat> my 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 experiences a couple times being in ireland and um jumping into you know one of the scenes in the pubs there where the musicians are all playing like everybody's just sort of like Playing their they're they're playing and they're improvising, but they're all playing their part. And it's not like any point like somebody somebody might take over for a minute and have their their thing happening. But generally, it's just like everybody just pooling their sounds. And you, and you were just weren't comfortable with that. So who knows? Like if you had a couple of more opportunities, you would have figured figured out how to you know uh, kind of inject yourself into that situation that felt just kind of like, how am I going to do my, my thing, my the, the thing that I do? Yeah, it's not like um, play the head, everybody take a solo, play the head. Yeah. Exactly that. Yeah. yeah, well, I guess, you know, in some ways, some people, that's why some people find jazz really boring because it's <clears throat> just because of that, you know, some younger people just find that goes, no, okay, uh, here comes the bass solo. Yep. <laughs> Time to talk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh dear. Did you run into um a situation where you learned that some of this music I'm playing has a spiritual connection to it and this feeling like I should know about this and maybe I should be more careful with it. Absolutely. I know exactly what you're saying and that has hit me many times because it is so, you know, this word that we use expropriation, et cetera, that you can be not under, you can be um, uh, involved, but not understand the, the deeper meaning of what it's about and that it could come off as, disrespectful uh or misinterpreted or um, any number of things i guess in the in the case of that because i guess you're talking about you know the the afro-cuban music um because so a lot of the music is from a very deep um you know spiritual religious context uh I guess I look at the musicians around me to inform me, you know, if if there's some it, uh, to inform me, uh, and also to inform myself to be inquisitive and and interested enough to to go deeper um, into what I am trying to um, perform. I mean, it's it's a tricky question because I play. You know, I have done a lot of work with the Afro-Cuban chants and, um, you know, arranging 
the music that I'm hearing. And that music is for um, spiritual practice. And the history, you know, goes back, you know, hundreds of years. Um, and at the same time, I'm not a practitioner, you know, of uh, Santeria or, or Afro-Cuban music, but um, the melodies are so beautiful and the rhythms are, you know, it's so, it, it's so open, you know, for improvising and, it, you know, it's coming from the same root, of course, as, uh, as jazz music. Um, so I just, you know, I try and inform myself as much as possible. Um, and of course, be surrounded by the other musicians that will, um, you know, knowing, I mean, I, I, I've often found when I have been performing that sometimes the guys are like so, so happy because they feel the music, what I have been doing has enhanced, you know, if it's playing for a certain deity, um, that it has really enhanced, they being practitioners, it has enhanced the music um, to who they are uh, acknowledging. So, uh, but it's it's interesting, you know, these things you do. It's just, um, does it swing? Tricky. Does the music swing for you? It's, di it's a different, no. It's it, it it mean it moves it it can in a way but um you can hear that sort of underline it but there's always you know just the um a lot of the time in the music there's so there's so many subdivisions so rhythmically it's more so like um it's vibe you know it's vibrations there's not it, it, there's like just kind of a I don't know, sometimes I feel very felt very 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 energized you know um from playing the music that it says giving me something back and um it's a different kind of thing yeah i have another swing, and swing swing is swing is hard too you know i'm still i'm still trying to well here's what uh, together here's what drummer ed shaughnessy had to say i asked him what is swing and he, he went on for quite a while so i'll just he says, now I think bluegrass music swings like hell. The me main too. thing that swing means for me is it's infectious, a beat that makes you want to move. It gets you going. So any music like bluegrass or jazz or funk or Watusi music communicates to you rhythmically and gets a visceral thing going. That's what I think swing is. Wow. Yeah, perfect. Thank you, Ed. You get it right on. Yeah. When you were... <laughs> I don't know if it's recruiting, if I can use that word, um, young women to to fulfill your vision. Was there a question about uh, like, what did their parents think of this idea? Did you describe the life of a musician? <laughs> oh, here's what you're getting into. <laughs> no. No, not at all. I mean, I would just hope, the hope that their parents wouldn't get, you know, get in the way and and try and stop it. But generally, um, you know, m Cubans love music, and you know, it's so deep in the people's lives. Like I, that's one of the things I've loved so much about Cuba is um, everybody loves music, and if you're a musician, you know, they 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 sort of welcome you with open arms. Um, and any any person, you know, if it could be somebody working in a restaurant or driving a cat, like all these, all the people know their music and know the musicians and have their opinions on who's good and who's bad. It's it's not like in North America where you could you could ask somebody, you know, who their favorite, what their favorite song is, and they're like, oh, I don't know, uh, or ask them, you know, ask some musical question, who who you think are the best, you know, ten such and such, like. People say, I don't know. <laughs> uh, what's, your, what's your favorite music? I don't know. But there, everybody has an opinion and is passionate about music. So the parents are generally the parents are pretty have been pretty, pretty down and, and involved in, in making it happen for their when did you if you remind me when you first went over there? So it would be around 81, 82. Because Ignacio Beroa, the the drummer, 
actually left there on the Mario boat lift because mm -hmm. he he felt like he couldn't he couldn't stay there and play because the the government frowned upon well he said first the beatles they frowned upon the beatles but also any jazz type music that seemed to like to you know we call it democratic or based on meritocracy or whatever but mm -hmm. he felt i have to get out of here yeah that's very true um Piquito too and um you know so many of the musicians yeah uh it's very true that's that's there's no doubting that's that's a fact and um you know some people um were uh, totally uh blackballed you know like um blockaded from doing the government just had the power to just say no you're not going to play and um that actually went on for quite a few quite a few years even after um you know the, the a lot of those great musicians left for the US um you know people i i know a lot of musicians that somehow were able to hear jazz through voice of america on the radio and, uh, and that was the only way they were able to hear it and people smuggling beetles and <laughs> bee gees <laughs> I don't know what that did for the music scene. No offense, Bee Gees, but <laughs> but um um love the Bee Gees. But yeah, th and and it's been hard, even you know, for a number of the musicians that um Larry and I have worked with over, you know, 40 years. Uh when we started to to go there, I was taking, I remember taking um my fake book down with, you know, all the standards and stuff like that. And that was something that was just impossible to get. And, and um, musicians taking photos with their cameras of the Facebook of like, Oh, all the things you are <laughs> and, and, and taking shots so that they could go get a photo of a tune so that they could, you know, learn the tune because they wanted the music. And um, by, you know, every means necessary, these guys were, were searching out, um, music from almost, outside of cuba i can almost picture you being in in customs going in at the airport and uh oh you got the e-flat real book here <laughs> busted <laughs> busted <laughs> yeah it, it it's it's been really difficult and 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 blocked you know like a the, the uh, when we made our first record spirits of havana in cuba um the group um yoruba and dabo which is pretty well known Afro-Cuban folkloric group now, they were not allowed to go into the recording studio, and um, which was called EGRAM. The government had taken over for, former RCA Victor Studios, um, and they weren't allowed to go in because um, they were looked at as only being um, dock workers, and uh, which they were. They all worked at the port. Um, they collected, you know, became a, a, a drum collective, um, and, you know, resurrecting a lot of the very old rumba, uh, music and, um, playing on the, you know, the boxes, the cajones and, um, they weren't allowed it to go into the studio. A lot of red tape had to be cut so that they had on their identity cards that they were allowed to go in. So those were like extremely extremely tough times for many many artists yeah let me ask you about your composing process there's a couple of things that i really like about it um partly in the category of orchestration with the unison vocal and the soprano sax and um also unison string bass and left hand piano on occasion um where do your compositions come from? Do you are you inspired by anything in particular? Pretty much everything. I know that's sort of a <laughs> typical question, but um, mm. that's a oh. hard question, monk. Because I think, like, I mean, I just, I just feel like I'm influenced by. So 
many things that I just hear, if it was, you know, particular pieces like Farrell Saunders and Leon Thomas, the creator has a master plan. I think of that. I think of Duke Ellington, Money Jungle. I think of McCoy Tyner. What's it called? Uh, that tune, Fly with the Wind. I think of um, Don Pullen, especially, um, you know, his music, which had a huge effect on me. Um, Carla Carl Blay, like everything. I, I, everything, everything. I just find everything informs me, really, to be honest. You go to the piano first? I sort of go between the two. I, I, I sometimes it'll start with the piano. Sometimes it might just start just with the horn noodling, like on the late last record. Um, you know, and that was sort of a lot of the music was written during COVID. I would just be sitting up in nature with my horn, and I just start playing a line. And so the seed of an idea came, and I would just keep you know work on work for that sort of maybe for you know an hour or so, and then. And then maybe later in the day, go down to the piano and say, oh, let's, let's see if I can figure out a big, what am I kind of, here? where is this going? So I go between the two things. Might start on the piano, might start on the horn. Does and, it have a tonal center for you? Like you're out in, in mm -hmm. as you say, going out to nature and you start. And the reason I'm asking that, um, I watched one of your performances that came from the Registry Theater. With, oh, boy. Kitchener, Ontario. I played in Kitchener actually. Really? <laughs> Many moons ago. Wow. But you had a long introduction on this particular tune. And I'm watching you and I'm wondering, what are you thinking? Was that was that with McKK or was that with Spirits of Havana? Spirits of Havana. Okay. I bet you I wonder if it was um I wonder if it was that song called "The River." Didn't have a didn't have an indication of the title, unfortunately. Sounds like me. <laughs> Forgot to introduce it. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I like doing intros. I like to kind of set up a an atmospheric thing before it gets crazy. Uh, I just you know, it's like it's I I like to paint. And it's the same thing, like, I'm, when I compose, I try and look at, like, a, like it's always, like, my first piece and my last, like, this is the first thing and probably the last thing I'll ever write. So let's make it, like, special and make it, like, a story, make it a statement, make it create, create something, you know, that's... um that wasn't there before you know it's like a, an empty canvas and you create a thing that um was not there before and and hopefully is memorable you know that is like just you just rang a bell with me. <laughs> i think memorable yeah. is very important as the song is done can you remember anything from it sing it back yeah that is very important to me because like like i especially nowadays because there's just so much you know, we're just like we are bombarded by um, so much stuff, right? Sensor sensory overload. If it's visual, if it's audio, and of course, everybody's different. For one, for what's memorable for one person is not. You know, some people find you know the the theme from Cats memorable. I want to <laughs> double shoot myself. No offense, Weber. Wait, till, wait, wait till we're done, okay? <laughs> okay, but anyhow, you know, everybody is different, and so what? For me, I I like things that are singable. That's the the the, the, the those are the th even if they're really difficult and wacky sounding. I mean, I find you know some of Ornette's, you know, re some of his heavier stuff. I still find it really memorable. You know, the, you, the you and Larry um, comment on each other's music and composing and so forth yes we we sure do he's he's my worst critic and i'm i'm his worst critic larry's but you know what it's it's really really great because uh um yeah he he, he you know his taste he he's been in he started working at a record store when he was like 15 years old 
and he's 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 attended way more jazz performances than I had because he was out. He was like, you know, in a late teen, he was already going out and driving to Buffalo and or with people, you know, to, to hear, you know, some hear Freddie Hubbard or to hear some of the greats that were were playing. And I was um, I was still kind of back listening to, you know, my Joni Mitchell records and Bob Dylan before I before I got deeper into jazz. And I I came at it from a very an eclectic uh, record collection because I kind of liked all kinds of music um, when I was young. And um, my big brother, Peter Burnett, he was a pretty strong jazz fan and into beat poetry and, into you know, he had everything. And I used to just love going into his room and pulling records out and putting them on and, 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 you know, seeing what else was out there. So, uh, but what I'm, what I'm trying to say is like, Larry's very, I think he's got very great taste and big ears and has heard a lot of music. Does, does the, um, are you asked, like I'm about to ask you about the women, women in jazz, the state oh. of women in jazz? Mm -hmm. Yeah. How do you feel about it right now? Um, well, I feel great if if there's a festival, it's a women's festival, and I'm playing at it. If it's a women's festival, I'm not playing at it. I hate it. <laughs> Here's a quote no, from uh, <laughs> a fairly recent downbeat. Yeah. Um, and I believe it's about Makaike. Band of young killer female musicians play like seasoned veterans. This music is a real treat from downbeat. Would it do you think we'll ever get to the point where they could say that same thing, but leave out female? I don't know. And would it be better? Or doesn't it, it probably, matter? Yeah, it probably would be better, but you know, just at the same, I don't know. Um, you know, I looked to somebody like Terry Lynn Carrington to answer those questions. And I really admire her. Um, because she has, she's been so honest and forthcoming about what she came up through. You know, she, she was, you know, she brilliant, talented, 10 year old or however old she was when she, you know, her, her family was like so totally behind her and, um, and, um, you know, so many of the musicians took her under their wing, which is just marvelous because she's just like one of the most consummate musicians in the world. And um, but at the same time, she she totally understands the what's happening, what's happened and what's happening for other women that maybe have found it really hard and had to. Had to be so hard nosed and tough uh to persevere you know with with you know everybody's story is so different and everybody's um it's hard enough you know to play jazz and improvise music without having those blocks up those things in front of you and um so that's still a really hard question for me to to answer because I've I've been fortunate in that I I surrounded myself with most of the time um, musicians that were extremely kind. I'm talking about male musicians that really kind and generous um, and. Um, motivated me and inspired me um but it's not always like that you know there's a and I, i've had i mean i've had a few experiences but they have been very few where i've really had been up against somebody extremely negative and um and i've had a you know i didn't i didn't feel i conducted myself in the best manner that i could have because I I didn't I don't have a skin 
built up for that. And I, I really lost it and got very angry um, with the person in a public forum because I was feeling some, some, I won't go into things, but there has been, you know, a few things if it's been a jam session or it's been in, in a situation where it felt um, I was being, you know, the hand was coming and I was being, um, I had no control uh and and that was upsetting um and then there's also you know sometimes you know that the thing that happens now I'm jumping to just opportunities um if is a festival and um and you hear back now people are very guarded now they don't they don't t so much talk like like this now but we've already got our our headline woman performer you know so, um, I mean, I feel like when I, when we started Makeke, I felt like I was pretty much ahead of the curve of the Me Too movement. Um, and I, in fact, I don't really know really too much um, about any all women Latin jazz ensembles, Cuban musicians that are, that are out there. So I felt... I did feel like I was working against that um, barrier, you know, to, 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 to do some festivals with my group. And, you know, the tricky thing with, for me is that um, entering the U S um, I, once, you know, the band goes into the U S with the visa situation, I sort of have to stay there. I've come back into Canada I have to buy new visas and also have have had to petition the State Department to go in with Makeke um, to perform in the U.S. Um, now a couple of the, my band members are now of um, our, our American citizens, citizens. They applied for asylum there and they've got it. Um, but still, this is what we've been up against, you know, up until about two two years ago, just just. And that's been that's really worked against me. Um, and sometimes, believe it or not, I find it really hard to be Canadian because I'm out of, I know you like everybody there, but um, yeah, because um, I'm not on this, you know, that's still kind of, that's sort of changing a tiny bit now too. But, you know, New York is very centric to, hey, we don't know about you. Yeah. We don't know about you. We don't know about you. Um, I'm not in. I'm not on the New York scene. I'm. I'm in Toronto. I'm based here. Um, I'm Canadian. I remember Paul Blay telling me to take it out of my bio. Take it out. Take the Canadian out of your. Oh, bless, bless, Uncle Uncle Paul. We call him. Um, take it out. You know. Get it. I remember him telling me to get a, an American address. Just get a box number in New York City. Be so much better than saying you're Canadian. Well, Paul, um, Schaefer, Paul Schaefer didn't take it out. This wasn't Paul. This is Paul Blay. Yeah. <laughs> Paul Blay. Yeah. Paul Schaefer. I say, hey, man, Paul Schaefer's Canadian. Yeah. And he's been pretty about, uh, about dance. Um, this is an odd question. Do you and Larry dance? <laughs> I love to dance. Larry, not so much. Okay. Because yeah. I... I saw one video um, of you playing in a, I don't know if it was a club or whatever, and, and people were dancing. And yeah. uh, I love playing for dancers. Mm -hmm. It seems to, I think it affects the band positively if, if things are in sync. It's really true. I like playing for dancers too. Yeah, I really do. Um, yeah, a lot of a lot of the time at our shows, people will um, get up and, and dance. It depends on the particular city. Some cities are more uh, you, you tend to see the more kind of hippies, and those those folks come out. And but um, yeah, dance. I mean, I remember Barry Harris, and I think a lot of other musicians of that era, um, the late Barry Harris, saying that you know when people stop dancing. Um, to, to you know, when the bebop started to really develop, people stopped dancing, and that was a really unfortunate um, aspect 
for the music because it's sort of like the, then it you know kind of made a distance between you know the musicians and the audience members and uh that's always great i don't know if you ever knew um fred taylor wonderful man who's a who was who booked scholars in um, cambridge massachusetts but um he was one of the first guys to put on um shows with with tap dancers and um you know some of the some of the drummers like i sorry i can't remember i want to say joe jones but i don't know if it was joe jones i think it might have been joe jones uh and jimmy slide and some of the some of the great jan dancers tap dancers that was really you know i'm i'm, I'm, I'm what do you call it um a collaboration a beautiful collaboration when you get in the studio with your group how do you have a technique to create the kind of spirit that happens live that's a great question hmm try to I think I think we try to, but it's that that's you know I guess it really depends on the conditions around the recording and how much um, how much we've rehearsed, you know, because we've been up against when we did our last record, we only had a couple of days. We brought the musicians in, and this was just you know shortly after things opened up after COVID. Um, we only had a couple days to, to do our recording. So a lot of stuff was worked out in the studio as opposed to other recordings where everybody has lived in our house. And we, um, and that, that situation was always kind of different because we'd be waiting for the visas. We, the, the, the girls would go for their interviews at the U S embassy here in Toronto um, <clears throat> we would have to wait, you know, a couple of weeks before the approval and being able to pick up the visas in that time, we would be rehearsing every day. So from morning till, you know, end of day and really, really workshopping the music and playing and experimenting. Um, and then, you know, the visa thing would happen and then we go out on the road and do you know a tour come back and do the recording and so then it so then it was so it was so easy to be able to just um because we were so seasoned with the music and it was so under our belt and everything um to make it feel like it was live in front of audience because we just got, had was coming off the road um and feeling really fresh and and had tried tried so many you know every angle to to shape the music and create something New. So generally it's that the ideal thing is to do it like that, I think. Yeah. Have you has that ever been an odd feeling for you to I won't say correct, but to make suggestions to your fellow musicians who grew up with this music and you want something yep. different from them? Yep. That's really that's a great. That's a wonderful question. And only a musician like you would say that question. Yeah, because um, I am a jazz musician and I'm hearing it come, I, I'm hearing it through, you know, I'm hearing what I hopefully want to do coming through having listened to Coltrane and Farrell Saunders and Sam Rivers and McCoy Tyner and you know, just just a long list of of musical greats, and uh, what you can do with simple melodic ideas, um, but beautiful harmonies, focusing on beautiful harmonies, and then you know, building on all the rhythmic beauty that Afro-Cuban music has to offer um you know all the subdivisions and the yeah um so and and of course in the afro-cuban music sometimes the clave is like really predominant and i've had a few times where 
I've written something and it might fall out of clave and the musicians, go, you know, will be playing something and they'll be shaking their heads going, it's not working. It's not, this isn't working because it's not in the, in the clave and da, 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 da. And then just takes a little time sometimes to think it out and say, whoa, well, what if we just put another bar right here and then the clave, I could still keep the melodic. I, the idea can still happen, but it'll just, and then, but it'll hook up again with the clave in, you know, in the next bar, or if it's, you know, however bar is going to take before it lines up again. And they go, oh, that works. <laughs> so there's rule breaking, but within, you know, it, within the creativity, there's somewhat some rule breaking, but, you know, you have to be respectful of, once again, the the genre. Uh, that, uh, does that answer the question? Yeah. <laughs> Years ago, when I was booking groups for school shows, we had a group come from Albany, Alex Torres and the Latin Kings. It was wonderful. And I got aggravated with myself because there was sometimes I couldn't find one. You're not alone. <laughs> <laughs> and they say, well, just listen to the clave. And I'm watching, goes, wait, no one's playing the clave. You know, like <laughs> specifically. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It's still a bit of a mystery to me, but it's so, as as Shaughnessy said, it's so infectious after a while. It says, well, I don't know where one is, but it sure feels good. So <laughs> that's so true. It really is. Yeah. You know, sometimes you can't put it, you know, you can't. You can you can feel it, and your body feels it if something like goes off, right? It's like having uh, two left shoes on or something like that. Just this morning, I was listening to one of your one of your videos, and I couldn't I couldn't really find where one was, but I I all of a sudden noticed that my my foot was tapping, so very unconsciously. But uh -huh. I said, "Well, interesting." Okay. <laughs> Not sure what the conclusion is there, but it's, it, you know, it 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 does take you know it does take um time. You know, I I the Cuban music came qu more quickly to me um than Larry in in terms of the clave and stuff. But for him, for me, when Larry you know plays beautiful uh, feeling of of swing, and sometimes I'm I don't feel. Um, as comfortable, you know, as he is with with uh, finding the pocket in 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 music that is more, um, you know, in the pocket swing. It it's um it's just something that that you have to you know spend a lot of time with and work on. Is it a challenge? You're both practicing musicians and artists. I think I know the answer to this, but it's a challenging way to make a living. Sure is. Really is. Especially right now. Um, you know, because the the how do we say it? Not the template, but what has worked for so long does not um, work as well anymore. So what we've been conditioned, you know, in the last rehearsal band, go out on tour, um, come home, make a record, everybody, you know, go, go, goes and does their thing for their own thing for a bit, then come back together. You know, uh, it's with the clubs, you know, so many of the clubs, arts presenters, funding cut back for the art presenters received. Um, it's in a changing environment for artists. And um, so many of my peers are um, teaching in universities and, and they're doing academia to supplement their their musical activities. You know, they have to teach. Um, some people are better teachers than others. Um, and um, 
you know, I, I look, it's just different because I, I look at all my, my musical heroes and, um, the only one I can really think of who taught was uh, Stanley Cowell, the late Stanley Cowell, uh, who he was at Rector's. Um, and he did that because, you know, I think he found the touring life, you know, again, had um, family and he found the touring life really strenuous. You know, he was out on the road with all everybody, Heath Brothers and Ross on Roland Kirk, and many. And, um, but when I think of, you know, the guys, Dewey Redman and Don Pullen and John Hicks and Billy Hart, they, they all, all these great musicians that I admire, they've all just lived off of their musical performance, their playing, their artistic endeavors, uh, their creative drive and, and their expertise in being hired. And, and those that that's gone. So I don't know. Um, it's just different to really have to, um, in, in my case, I'm trying to maybe open up a bit more to collaborating with more, with more musicians and that, in so that will allow me to stay in a, in a creative space, which is what I really thrive on. I love collaborating. I love throwing ideas out and then getting them thrown back and people adding, adding to, to make something, um, enhance it, make it better. Um, I, I don't thrive in academia. Um, I, I still love going out with young people and, doing clinics like a doing a clinic or a workshop but i could not do a i could not do a full-time musical uh hold a hold a teaching position because it's just not in i it's not in my creative spirit have you ever had a student at one of these uh perhaps workshops um ask you if you use a particular jazz technique and you don't really know what they're talking about. I mean, it's happened to me. Um, something that they've learned from a book or from yeah. something, uh, you know, some video on YouTube. And yeah. they, so when do you use that? And I'll go. Yeah. Uh, well, I have to be, you know, I have to be honest. Some, uh, um, you know, if I'm aware of something, um, you know, to give you an example, Jamie Abersall, like Jamie Abersall, <clears throat> look what Jamie Ab Abersall has done for the jazz world. I just think the guy is incredible. You know, so many people, he, he, he made those instruction books, those play along tapes. He has like created um a forum for so many people that are just like if they're amateurs if they're young students to get their skills together to get their confidence up even if you can to go to a jam session and be able to play one piece at that jam session because you've like <laughs> practiced your butt off <laughs> to a Jamie Jamie a one a two I want, you know, if, if somebody tells me the use of stuff, I say, that is just fantastic. But have you listened to, like you listened to, uh, you know, Silver Serenade, you know, they're playing that tune or, any, you know, that's just an example. But have you heard, have you heard Horace Silver actually play that tune? So I try not to discourage people if there's things that are inspiring them, you know, that, um, uh, but you know, take it further. Always try and, if you can, go to do this to the source. Um, and actually, a couple of times, students have pointed something out to me that I was like, "Oh, that's pretty cool." I didn't, yeah, I didn't know that. So I've actually sometimes learned something, you know, the because they're out, they're out there, like on all that stuff. Like they sure are. 
they're madmen, right? Just checking all that stuff out. And that's, that's, that's great. So I think, you know, got to have a balance. Yeah. So you're at a cocktail party and somebody who's fairly well off gets to know you a little bit. So, and they say, so Jane, my, uh, my niece is a good saxophone player and she wants to be a jazz musician. What do you think about that? What should she do? I would say I would give that person my phone number and say, have her call me. That's exactly what I do. And that's what I've done. Here's my phone number. Here's my email. Oh, I'd love to talk to your daughter, niece, whoever it is, and uh, encourage them and then see where they're coming from. I've got a number of young people that, that call me that um, that are just sort of embarking on maybe, um, you know, going out there and doing something. But, you know, there's, a, unfortunately, there's, a, there's also a lot of fear um, of failure. And uh, of course that's, you know, uh, everybody, well, not everybody, because I know people that, I know people that are fearless. I'm not fearless. I sometimes get my, I can, if I'm really, really, um, what's the word called? Inspired or my vision is so, so strong about something, I will pursue it. But, uh, you know, I'm, 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 I'm fear, uh, I fear often of failure. And I think now it, that is like at, at just an all, all time high, um, and also, there's the uh, the other side of that where there's just plain kind of ignorance and and just sort of um, uh, people that haven't put the hours in and 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 don't have a, the respect for the music in that I I feel you should have um, and for what's you know, the history uh, of the music that are out there, like just glutting the market with terrible stuff, you know, really, bad, really, really bad stuff. So there's a fine line between, between the two things. I mean, it's just, you have to be authentic to, to yourself. And if I, if I see somebody who's really, um, you know, pursuing something and serious about it, I'll, I'll do everything I can. I, I, I was, I was, Dewey Redman and Don Poole, and they were very big mentors to me. And they were, you know, probably two of the heavy, you know, heaviest musicians sort of out there on the scene. And um, they were so encouraging to me. So I feel like, you know, if I can try and be like that, I should try, try and do the same thing. Yeah, I'm yeah. happy to hear that because sometimes um, the same question another musician would be much more... Um, not encouraging well you just better be aware that this and that and yeah i mean i i don't think there's any point in telling people that because um like um you know there's just no reason to discourage somebody it's somebody if if you don't make it you don't make it you know what i mean like there's well i don't i don't see i don't know i just don't i don't agree with that it's not it's not in my nature to discourage people um they'll they'll find that out for themselves you know what i mean it's not you don't need to tell anybody and everybody of course develops at such as you know such a a different pace i you know i didn't get i didn't pick up my soprano sax until i was i think i was like 30 oh, i'm just trying to think how old i was but i was maybe like 30 what's the math seven i bought my horn in 78 so what's the math on that okay <laughs> what's the math 88 98 so i bought my horn in 1978 so i don't know why didn't you I'm 68 a, why didn't you become a jazz pianist you um i had right. yeah i had tendonitis and oh. Yeah, and I was I was studying um, 
classical piano and I had a very a rebellious uh, adolescence. I went to five high schools, um, getting kicked out of, out of a few of them. And, um, and, and I, did, I really didn't, I, I loved art and I was, um, my last year, I guess I was in an art school and I thought I wanted to paint and I always thought I want to do this, I want to do that. And I finally got serious about piano and uh, I went at it a little too vigorously and I developed a tendonitis and um and then when I came, I I had to take time off from the piano I did finally get my grade 10 piano studies which was a big deal for me um but then I realized you know I was not going to be in that forum I was not going to be a class, classical piano player just the must everything was it was not so I was went to San Francisco and, and heard Mingus. And when I came back from that trip, I heard him like over five nights. And when I came back from that trip, I decided I really wanted to play jazz. And uh, I bought a flute around that time and I sort of like just kind of dinkering around on the flute. <clears throat> and then friends from school, you know, just on the weekends, somebody would be playing you know, a couple of guitars and bass player and we'd just be jamming you know on two chord things and I don't know what we were playing but anyway and I would play the flute to the devil but I don't know I really didn't know what I was doing but you know having a great time doing it and um so then I just sort of I transitioned then I started to put the things together um coming back from San Francisco I remember telling Don because he was in the shows in San Francisco that I thought all the I thought Mingus's band was all classical musicians. Oh. I thought they were all studied classical musicians. I didn't, you know, I didn't re I didn't realize that the there were different skills to do that kind of thing than there is to playing. Oh, sure, Don was a classical piano player, and he th he thought that was hilarious when I when I told him that. Um, but. Um, yeah, so I just, I transitioned and then I just started like, you know, uh, by hanging out in record stores and pulling a record. Who's this guy? Charlie Parker. Can you put this on? And, you know, being humiliated by the guy, you don't know Charlie Parker. <laughs> yeah. I remember, I remember, I remember having um, Joni Mit the Joni Mitchell record with uh, um, my analyst told me. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Hendrix and Ross. Danny Ross, and I remember, and I, I remember saying, "Oh, I really love this record." Um, uh, Joni Mitchell sings like um, my analyst told me, and the, the two guys that ran the store like looked at me like they just wanted to like toss me out the place. It's like you don't, don't know who you know. No, don't you know? know? And they went over to the thing and like held up the, the Hendrix and Ross, Lambert Hendrix and Ross record, and um. So there was a lot of humiliation in, in going through the steps. But all these people, like they were, you know, I was willing to learn and they were willing to put records on. And, and so I just went at like that. And that's that's how I sort of transitioned. I, I still love to play piano. But, you know, if I sit at the piano for too long working on something, I, my my wrists are are aching. Well, I, I want to wrap up with two uh, quick things. One is just an observation. I watched um, your group play the NPR Tiny Desk. And after the first tune, I was uh, informed by watching you that it was a lot of work because you were really out of breath. Do you recall that? No, I'm, I'm going to check it out. <laughs> yeah, you should watch because it reminded me of watching uh, one time I was in the wings at a dance company thing. And, you know, they were so graceful and stuff. And they came off stage and they were panting and sweating. And I wow. said, wow, this is a lot of work. And that you put an awful lot of like physical effort into the music. Uh-huh. It's true. So the other yeah. question is, um, this is a little... <laughs> like off topic, but I'm, I'm also interested in what artists think about other things. Down here in the States, on occasion, when people get concerned about politics and the way things are and what's going to happen, and if this happens, 
I'm going to have to move to Canada. Yeah. That's a, that's yeah. a thing that we sometimes say. And yeah. Not so yeah. easy. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have any observations on watching what's going on in the States? Well, yeah, it's sad. It's really sad. Um, and right now we're, we're having, we're, we're, you know, our elections are coming up in the next couple of years. And so we're sort of, we've got a, we don't have a lot of choices right now, but we certainly, it's, Certainly nothing like what could possibly happen in your fine country. So um yeah, it's up it's 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 absurd, eh? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, I've heard that so much from from friends that are saying, I'm coming there. <laughs> I was like, well, the borders are not so easy to come through. That's that's uh, you know, the, the borders are definitely tightened up on on both sides for sure. It's not so easy for, for me to come into the U.S. either. I see. Mm -mm. Well, we'll keep making music and hope for the best. Yeah, I, I've so enjoyed speaking with you today. It's, it's great to, um, you know, you're not only a wonderful interviewer, but uh, the fact that you're coming at it from, you know, knowing about the music and and artistically the, the you know, the thought process that that we as musicians um, go through is really, it's, 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 it's so interesting always to, to answer those kind of questions because sometimes we just take it for granted, right. In our own, um, in our own development and musical journey, what's how, how you think, you know, I, I uh, so it forces you to think about how you think about what you do. Yeah, I'm also, uh, you can't see it, but on the wall in front of me, I have four pages of information about you, including your your awards and nominations, and the fact that you can share um, a record display with your band on top of Duke Ellington and just down the road from our Tatum. I know, isn't that sort of <laughs> self, self yeah. gratification it is? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I got to admit, and then... And then I got some of the great people that oh Betty Carter, yeah. Okay. With this crazy this Slim Gaylor. Oh yes. So Slim Slim uh, um lived in our off and on with us for four years. Is that right? Oh my god, what a what an incredible what an incredible wacky wacky time that was. And and then a chance to work with the great Hermeto Pachual. Did a big concert here with him. And John Hendricks did some shows with John Hendricks here. And who else? Of course. Stanley Cowell, one of my heroes. Stanley Cow. Well, that's one beautiful, beautiful record. And this was one of the most inspiring records for me. That was one that was Don Pullen's solo record. That was sort of in between. That was done 1975. Wow. Well, young musicians will be holding up your records and say, I played with Jane. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you for thank your you. time. This has been delightful. Monk, thank you. I really enjoyed it. And I hope we get to meet in, in person sometime soon. That would be so great. All right. Best of luck with you and your group and Larry. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Keep in touch, okay? And I'll continue to watch your awesome, your awesome video interviews. All right. Over and out. Okay. Thanks so much.